welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and today we're talking about the Third Commandment, uh, which reads as follows, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. That's from Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. And we see an example of this commandment being broken in the New Testament in the book of Acts. Greg, do you want to take us there? Sure. This is Acts 19. Paul is ministering in the city of Ephesus, and it says this, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, when the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. So Paul's having a very successful uh, healing ministry, long distance as it were, and even demons are getting kicked out of their human hosts just by the presence of a blessed apron or handkerchief. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. Yeah. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. So you get you get the idea here. They these guys have seen Paul directly and perhaps indirectly cast out demons, and they they know that the one thing he's got going for them that they've never tried is using the name of Jesus. So they confront a demon possessed man, and they're going to try using the name of Jesus too. And in case there's any doubt as to who this Jesus might be. They include Paul as a reference, Jesus whom Paul preaches. So the evil spirit, using the voice of the human host, apparently, answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, (laughs) but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds, many of them also which used curious arts, that's magic, brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it at 50,000 pieces of silver, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. So what we are looking at is two very different conceptions of the name of God. These uh, vagabond Jews, in keeping with the religious Hellenic influences in Ephesus and Asia Minor, thought that there's an ontological connection between the word and the metaphysical substance. If I know the name of a thing, then I have power over that thing. And all I have to do is learn the true name of a phrase that's common in in magical writings. But what is its true name? What is its hidden name? What is the secret name? If you know that, then you have control over anything, even over the gods themselves. Whereas, well, it didn't work, did it? (laughs) Whereas Paul was successful because Jesus had given him a commission to cast out evil spirits. And when Paul said, get out, it wasn't his word. It wasn't his power. It was not even a power he was channeling. It was the power of Jesus, of whom he was simply the human agent announcing what Jesus wanted done, to which the demon had no choice but to yield. So we're talking about a magical approach to naming versus a covenantal approach to naming. Before we came online, Emily and I were saying, this all sounds really familiar. Haven't we talked about all this before? (laughs) Because in essence, we have, I and mean, we keep coming back to these same themes, but we're only in the book of Exodus, you know, we just got through Genesis and Exodus, and so we're still immersed in pagan cultures, not that we ever really shake free of it in the Old Testament, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're at a point where the children of Israel have just come out of Egypt, and Egypt is drenched in magic and magical apparatus and thinking and talismans and hieroglyphics and all that. One of their greatest gods, uh, what's his name? It's Manifestation of Ra, uh, Kepri, created himself by speaking his own name. Now, think about that one for a while. Didn't come into existence until he spoke his own name first. That's a, that's a chicken and egg problem. <laughs> yeah. 
There's a later story I ran into some other connection where uh, ISIS wants control of Ra's powers. Ra's the sun god, the greatest of the gods, and ISIS is his descendant. So she manages to slip something into, I don't remember, slips him a Mickey in some fashion. <laughs> and he gets sick and he gets worried. And she says, but I, I am the goddess of healing. I can make you better. All you have to do is tell me your real name and I can work deep magic and make you well. And you won't be an old tottering man dottering across the sky. And he hymns and haws. But finally, he's getting pretty sick. And so he says, OK, my real name is. And then she uses his real name against him, grabs all his power and confines him to his chariot. So he can sail this the skies and, and make things nice and warm and bright all he wants, but he's staying out of everyone else's affairs and she's the big cheese now. There's another thing we'll come back to when we get to the fifth commandment of how gods and goddesses always turn on their parents and attack them and usurp mm -hmm. their authority, except for Jesus. Anyway, th this, this is how Egyptian culture saw the word, the name. You, there's, uh, again, as above, so below. The whole universe is geared to use a Newtonian metaphor, to the point that if we can find the little gear, we can turn the big cosmic gears. In this case, names, words spoken in the right order, consonants order, spoken in the right order, the right rhythm. You don't have to understand them. They just work. They're, well, magic. <laughs> and what God is saying in the third commandment is I, that's no. Second commandment said no idols to try to uh, force my hand. This one's saying no magic words to force my hand. The second commandment forced us toward words. Just, just at the first commandment it forced us away from other gods to the true God. We said, okay, but we'll use images. And the second commandment said, no, you're going to use words. We say, okay, we'll use words to <laughs> bind God. No, you won't. And if you're going to use my name at all, you're, going not, you're not going to use it in a light and frivolous fashion. Um, the word, and I, you were saying this in another context earlier, Emily, the word take, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Uh, it's not the normal word for speak. It means to pick up something and carry it around with purpose, to bear something about so that people will notice it, so that you can use it. An old pastor of mine rendered it something like, you shall not you take up the name of the Lord your God in a cavalier fashion. Hmm. And what we want to talk about uh, it's what it means for us as Christians to use God's name. We, we, we've got this ontological thing down. Words are not, do not control metaphysics. They do not control reality. We're not sorcerers. We're not magicians. It doesn't work. But then Jesus gives us his name to you. So how does that work? And thinking covenantally now, what does it mean to recognize what is God's name? What does it mean to speak God's name? How should we use God's name? What circumstances do we use God's name? And what happens when we stop doing it the right way? What happens to society? One thing that jumped out to me uh, during your description of, of all that is how much the heart of that commandment is lost in modern charismaticism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, especially um, kind of in its fullest expression in the word of faith movement. Mm -hmm. I rebuke because... this disease in Jesus' name. Exactly. And yeah. it can be anything from disease to poverty to that hangnail that is annoying <laughs> you right now. It, 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 is, it becomes something so frivolous that it doesn't mean anything anymore. And more so, it's my contention that that movement is inherently magical at base because it sees the name of God and the power of God as something to be used at a whim. Mm -hmm. That's my two cents. Now, before we go on, Brian, um, would you, uh, you've done this before, but I think it's relevant. Could you share a little bit of why you are entitled to speak on this in some ways more than I am? <laughs> um, well, I, am entitled to speak to this, yes, um, mainly because I was raised in the Word of Faith Pentecostal tradition from birth until, say, I think I left that church around the age of 19, 1920, something like that. And so I've been around it. And the more I look at it, the more I realize how deeply influenced by paganism it is. 
But you wouldn't say that these people you went to church with aren't believers, would you? It depends on the individual, but as a whole, no, I would not make that claim. Okay. Well, all churches have hypocrites and people who don't know what they're saying and mm -hmm. people who are functional idolaters. So we, 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 it is possible to critique a movement. This mm -hmm. is something that American Christians have a hard time with. We <laughs> yeah. can't critique a movement without consigning everyone in that movement to hell or even saying that we're nicer than they are. Uh, mm -hmm. Very, very nice and sweet and godly people in that movement, but you, there is that constant tug back to well, God's powerful, God can do the miraculous, He did it in the Old Testament, Jesus and the apostles did it. Why can't I do it right now? And, and there are some flaws in the logic there, but what there is a whole lot more of is a lack of scriptural content. It's one thing to say, Yeah, God, God can do miracles. Yes, he can. God did miracles in the Old Testament under certain occasions. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. And Jesus for certain did miracles. purposes. For certain purposes, yeah. Uh, Jesus did miracles on certain occasions for certain purposes, and other times didn't. Uh, he healed the, the one man at the sheep pool and skipped over lots of others. Paul, toward the end of his ministry, had to leave one of his guys behind sick because apparently he was, despite the outpouring of miracles here at Ephesus later on, he was not able to or allowed to or authorized to perform so many miracles. So we, it's at this point we begin to study the Bible to see why God did these things, what the purposes were, and whether or not God, along the same lines under the same conditions, plans to do them today. And then the next question, through me. Mm -hmm. uh, even to say that, that, that God does miracles today is not to say that he does them through me or through my pastor, that that is something that would require evidence, not just the general, well, I believe in a God of miracles. So do I. But as, as you read the Old Testament, God was not on call at man's demand. Men could not simply snap their fingers. Even the greatest of the prophets and the apostles could not simply snap their fingers and have whatever they wanted on all conditions. God sometimes put rather heavy constraints on what they were allowed to do and what he said, no, you, you, that's not happening right now. And even um, even during Jesus's ministry, there were things Jesus said that are incongruent with the modern mm -hmm. take on, on the ministry of the Spirit. Like when uh, they meet the man who was blind from birth and they ask, mm. who, who, who sinned, him or his parents? And yeah. he goes, you know, why, why is this man blind? He goes, he's blind so that I can display the power of God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Neither him is, nor his parents. Yeah, it's not. And he doesn't even frame it as a, you know, I'm doing this for his good, even though certainly it was something for that man's good. But he says at base, like the reason he had this horrible thing happen to him from youth was so that I could be here at this moment and heal him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's something that some of our charismatic friends do not always reckon with. The, the idea that God does not want everybody wealthy, healthy, and wise right this second. Ultimately, of course, we believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. But we don't get everything we want now because oftentimes what we the In fact, the whole problem oftentimes <laughs> is with our wants. Yeah, this yeah. whole doctrine of sanctification, this process we're in, in which the Spirit takes the lead, often has to do with challenging our wants. Teaching yeah. us to die to self and to live with things we really would rather not want. Uh, and, and you could talk here about the things that both Jesus and the apostles say about suffering and persecution and tribulation, dying to self, doing without, for the glory of God. So as, as we're not in any way minimizing the power of God or the authority that God gives his people. But, but here's the first thing I think we, we begin to talk about. When Jesus gives us his name and says you have power... It's power to do what he wants, mm -hmm. not power to do what we want. Mm -hmm. And this is perhaps a good time to introduce the concept of power of attorney. We know it well enough in civil life and in legal life. Somebody, probably somebody with, well, it used to be somebody with some money, but now somebody getting older about to die oftentimes, will go to a relative, a friend, a son, daughter, and say, I am granting you my power of attorney. And there are legal documents involved in signing and countersigning. And from that point on, the person who's received the power of attorney may act in the name of that person 
and use that person's assets, spend their money, sell their property. But the assumption always is that you are acting in the best interest of that person, either according to their general wishes, you know, sell this house, sell everything, buy me a vacation home in Florida, make it happen. <laughs> or according to very specific detailed instructions that have been laid out in advance. But whatever the case, when the person who has the power of attorney starts funneling money into his own bank account because it would make him feel good and safe to do that, or there's that new Mercedes he's really been looking at, or that mean coat his wife has her eye on, yeah, that's called embezzlement. That's called theft. Uh, the person who gives you his name to use gives restrictions that surround the authorization. And when we don't submit to those restrictions and instructions, then we become embezzlers, we become thieves, we become all of ourselves. And we, we think we're all that when we're not. Uh, we have to stay within the parameters of the law or of the contract or of the document that, that invested us with the power of attorney, or we're, we're subject to all kinds of legal consequences. Now, we, we know that in, in normal life, and we need to understand that when Jesus gives us his name, and we're going to talk, I guess, about some of the ways he does that and some of the ways we use his name, the, the, the assumption here, right, right up front, we're talking about doing miracles, is that we do them on his schedule, according to his will, for his purposes, on his timetable, in the geographical place where he has designated they should happen to the person he has pointed out to us. It's not a, a, a superpower where we can just walk through the world touching things and making them gold or making them well or making them whatever. <laughs> so I was thinking about this as I was reading through the uh, reading through the end of Isaiah and the beginning of Jeremiah as God is berating Israel and lamenting that they've misused his name. And in that context, it's not only have you prophesied false things and said that I said them, but you've played the harlot. And that made me think of this commandment that this is the description of a covenant union, mm -hmm. like marriage. Like when David and I got married, I took David's last name. Um, and that's something that's happening to Israel as they are forming this union, as God is forming this union with them. And so this, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Don't take the name and then pretend that it's a light thing. Cast it off. Act like you don't belong to me. Um, that just really was vivid to me in the end of Isaiah and the beginning of Jeremiah this week. Later on in Jeremiah, there's something similar. Unfortunately, I don't have the reference, although our pastoral intern spoke about it I think last night. When uh, Jeremiah's prophesying uh, the captivity, he says, you're going to go among the Gentiles and I'm going to be upset with you because you will have profaned my name. Well, how are we going to do that? Because you're going to do wickedness. You're not going to be keeping my laws. And people are going to look at you and say, so this is how Yahweh's people live. And they'll get the wrong idea about me, not because you even mention my name as such, but because they identify you with me, and then they start saying bad things about me uh, based on your behavior. Uh, so there, there are a great many ways that we can uh, take God's name in vain. And yeah, not, not living up to our, our calling before him. It's pretty high on the list. We are called Christians. Yeah, how many? Uh, my daughter Haley was, uh, she's in a, a history class at a secular college. And they were reading some uh, original source material on the things leading up to the Civil War. They came to the statements that some of the churches and Christian leaders were making about slavery before the war came. Uh, and it was part, I guess it was part of a, a quiz or a test or a problem or something. And she came away very frustrated because he's saying, these people are, are calling themselves Christians and they're saying this and they're saying that. And she was supposed to pick the one that, that she could attack most easily. The problem was she felt she could attack all of them. <laughs> um, because, Ever the problem. Yeah, Ever because, the problem. because they all were treating slavery as no big deal. Uh, they were not pointing to the racism involved. They were not pointing to the fact that even if you granted a biblical status, they, they weren't obeying biblical law in, in any respect. 
Uh, they weren't talking about the New Testament's uh, take on, on slavery and all that. They just were assuming that, uh, in fact, that the first one she read to us is, you know, it's okay if you, uh, if you want to teach the gospel to your slaves and their children and they get baptized, because that's not going to set them free anyway. So you can go ahead and do that. That's okay. Great. Yeah. Wow. Well, the great, <laughs> the great part is this. She says, these Christians there are being such a horrible testimony to my classmates now. Mm. because as a Christian, I have to go in and say, yeah, those were my Christian brothers and sisters. They were so wrong, but I can't undo what they said or what they wrote then. And so these people, by taking this, this stance on, on black slavery, you know, what is it, uh, 150, 60 years later, their, their actions are still profaning the name of God. And so this is how Christians think. Well, it's how some Christians thought, and they were <laughs> wrong, and we have to be willing to say that. It'd be nice if we didn't. Tangent, uh, are you familiar with Mark Knoll's little book, The Civil War as a Theological Crisis? No, I'm not. I, I am, Mark. and I need to get it. Yeah. I need <laughs> to get it. <laughs> so excellent. It is a great little book, very short but very dense, analyzing different Christian perspectives about slavery and about the Civil War and just taking it piece by piece. Here's this church in the North. Here's the same kind of church yeah. in the South. Here's it there. Here's it there. Here's it there. And the different denominations, just very thorough, mm -hmm. very exemplary scholarship. Mm -hmm. I have his little yeah. book on how Christians reacted to the revolution, but I did not know he had done the Civil War. So yeah, I'll have mm -hmm. to, nice. I'll have to obtain that. That's going to be good. Well, here are some, some general things about the name of God. Names in scripture represent generally, represent, there's that word again. Mm -hmm. It's a covenantal word. They say something about the person who bears them. God named the first man Adam, red dust. Uh, he called himself Ish, <laughs> the guy, and her, Isha, <laughs> the girl, the gal. But later named her Eve, Haba, the mother of all living. Eve called her first son, got it, <laughs> possessed, possession, acquired, <laughs> came. And then the second one came along, yeah, well, what's up with him? Hello. Vanity, yeah, yeah. yeah. Vanity, um, breath vapor. Uh, Noah means peace, Abraham, a father of nations, Sarah, princess, Isaac, laughter, Jacob, uh, supplanter, Edom, red, <laughs> Judah, praise. Uh, and, and so we go, Jesus means Jehovah saves. Uh, and and so this, this was a common theme. And we get a small sense of this sometimes in American culture. You know, we call somebody slim. Well, we may mean he's really slim. We may mean quite the opposite, depending Red usually means they've got red hair. Sometimes our names actually do correspond with reality. More often in American culture, we're naming our kid. If you're not a Christian, if you're a Christian, you may be, may be naming him after a Bible character. Uh, but more often you're naming him after somebody you know. You're naming him after a movie star, your favorite uh, superhero or, or sci-fi fantasy character. And now we're moving to States of the Union, it seems. Um, <laughs> But there was a time in most cultures where the names were not in another language. They were in your language and, and they carried some kind of meaning. And so when God begins to tell us his names, and he, in a broad sense, he has many names. They all speak to who he is. He's Elohim, the God who created heaven and earth. He's El Shaddai, God Almighty, El Alam, the everlasting God, El Elyon, God Most High. And, and Adonai, he's Lord. And at some point, some point, of course, we come down to he is Jehovah or Yahweh. When Moses said, um, they, Israel's going to want to know who in the world you are. What your name is. What am I supposed to tell them? God simply says, I am. I'm me. I am that which I am. Uh, I, I have no other. You want a full revelation of me? It's me. There's, uh, there's, there's nothing, else. which by the way means that Jesus has to be God since he's the revelation of God and not a part of God or, or a dimension of God. He must be the totality of God, all the fullness of God had bodily or doesn't work. Anyhow, <laughs> but not really. I mean, that's, we're talking here 
about how God reveals himself. And at this point, it is probably worth pointing out that just as Jesus is the image of God, second commandment, face of God, first commandment, he is the name of God. And God says of the angel of the covenant, my name is in him. Jesus' name is above every name. He is the full revelation of who and what God is. And then Jesus himself, Jesus, uh, Jehovah saves, Christ or Messiah, the anointed one, prophet, king, and priest of our redemption, Emmanuel, God with us, Lord of lords, king of kings, way, truth, and life, and so on. Uh, and all of these tell us true things about God. So first thing we say is that the name represents God, reveals God, tells us true things about God so that we can understand him better, walk with him more faithfully. But then we come back again to this idea. And now, now that we have this name, now that we are in on the secret of what God's name is, and God says, and you can use my name, now we have to use the name not in a cavalier fashion, not lightly. But seriously, we, we, you mentioned uh, the marriage covenant. Uh, the three basic covenants in human society are family, or marriage, the church, and the civil commonwealth, the state. So in church, um, do you promise in the Lord to submit to the government of this church and should you be found delinquent in doctrine or life? Something like that. Uh, within the civil realm, we say, I, uh, if we're standing in court, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Or I swear to uphold the Constitution and so on. What's the other one? <laughs> well, that's, that was marriage, church, well, marriage, we just, we've done. Mm -hmm. Till death do us part. A very serious thing. All of these things are serious. Now is perhaps a good time to distinguish between an oath and, and a vow. An oath is self-maledictory. We call on God not only to observe our performance and non-performance, but should we violate, wantonly violate the oath, the covenant that we've created by our oath, we invite God to destroy us utterly to the point of ripping us in two, throwing out our entrails and feeding our corpse to the birds of heaven and the beasts of the earth, or more simply, burn us forever in hell. Vows are not quite that. Vows are, I promise, and, and I'm calling on God keep my promise, but I'm not actually asking him to kill me if it goes wrong. So they're sort of a lower level. <laughs> but they all do involve, to some degree, uh, the use of God's name. Mm -hmm. Now, we can, we can look at them negatively, like God, God, we're calling God to judge and, 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 and to enforce. But what is it that we're calling God to witness to and to enforce? We have marriage. Is marriage... A, it is easy to think of marriage as romance crystallized, and that's true in some, some manner. But in a far more practical manner, marriage is God's task force for dominion. I mean, that's the original instruction. Be fruitful, multiply, take dominion over the planet, subdue the earth. It has a structure. It has laws that govern it. Uh, it has commitment and communion going on. And it is a powerful force in society to be reckoned with until we start breaking it, cheating on our spouse, not keeping our promises, not doing the very things we said we would do, and then the whole thing falls apart. The state, marvelous thing that God gave us. Well, at least it should be, could be, maybe was, maybe could be one day. Uh, but a lot of the time, our civil rulers and the people who vote for them or put them in power do not stand up to the, the qualifications and standards that God has set upon the civil government. And so again, we get tyranny, we get anarchy, we get social chaos in one direction or the other. And what happens when the church decides that it doesn't need to play by God's rules, that it can use Jesus' name as a sort of advertising to get members and to show how great we are and how cool we are and all the marvelous things we've got because we talk about Jesus a lot. Mm. Yeah, that's also very destructive of society. God has bound society in terms of these three institutions as sort of pillars or foundations. A number of times God speaks of the pillars of the earth. And this is kind of what he's talking about. He's talking about church, state, and family with their uh, included uh, magistrates and representatives. This is the thing that human society rests upon, foundations of social order, as it were. And beneath them, of course, is the fundamental covenant that we have with God and Christ. And its truth is expressed in Scripture, which is then in turn that has been uh, crystallized in the creeds and confessions of the church. That faith, the faith once delivered for the saints, that's the foundation of society. And when we build 
covenant institutions in terms of that, we get really stable, strong societies where people keep their contracts and their commitments and their covenants. But when it's all about me and I don't care about you and I, there's nothing that's going to make me keep my word, not even the name of God, then everything falls apart and we don't have a whole lot left. And that's kind of the world we're looking at these days, it seems. So bring us back to magic. Magic. You know, we live in a secular world. We don't believe in magic anymore, right? <laughs> Except for all those novels. <laughs> By the way, I'm not bad talking them. I read them. <laughs> Shame on you. Actually, no. So I, I work at a coffee house that is right down the street from a little shop that sells crystals and packets Oof. of sage and incense and all manner of things that I I, I dislike very much. <laughs> I mean, I like incense because it smells nice, but this is a thriving business opportunity in today's world. Mm. And what's interesting too is we 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 shouldn't make the mistake of saying that those things are like those objects are suddenly inherently right. bad because yeah. you know incense does have a proper use if you want your room to smell nice or <laughs> sage if you want your what room you? to smell nice uh, <laughs> or to flavor oh, food or something if you like how crystals look or you yes. want to set one in a ring like there <laughs> there are godly uses for these things we're yeah. not saying that it's the use. It's the use of them. Yeah. <laughs> These are being marketed explicitly as magical yes. goods. Oh, so. uh, but of course, those who do so will tell you, no, this is not demonic at all. Uh, uh, there's, Satan is not involved. Now, they may start slipping in words like spirits or not. Mm -hmm. They may more probably talk about the forces of the earth, of the planet. Or energy. Things, yeah, that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sending because, good vibes your way. Yeah. yeah. Good you know, vibes, as Christians, good we, think of, we think of magic, we automatically go to Satan for good reason. <laughs> but we do need to understand that people who practice magic don't usually actually make that connection. Um, they see it as powers inherent in the universe, which is exactly the age-old philosophy of continuity of being that we've been dealing with all along. But they don't have to include Satan by name to make it work. And they, they generally don't. They generally accuse us of lying about them because they know it's not about saying it's about who you are and your potential. <laughs> Interesting enough, those were basically the word Satan used. <laughs> having, having said that. You can be as gods. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of being as gods, um, the, the place that there, there are people, of course, who frequent those shops and buy their stuff and are a little la la. That's okay. They're, they're, they're their souls are in danger, but in terms of a threat to society, they, they may be down on the chain of, of, of great, great threats to the universe. What's far more dangerous are people who think that because they have power, real power, political power, bureaucratic power, maybe scientific power, technocratic power, that they actually can, with a few words, rearrange human society hmm. in the best interest of all of us. I remember a recent president, when challenged about his, his social agenda, said, hey, I'm the president. I've got a pen and a cell phone. What he was saying is, with the written word of the spoken word, I can alter the social structure of this country. I have the power. What was probably far more alarming than his attitude was the attitude of so many people who voted for him, who simply assumed that because now he was president, everything was going to change. The familiar story of one dear black lady who goes to her bank and says, "Why, why I keep getting these these notices about my mortgage?" The guy in Washington, we elected him. I don't have a mortgage anymore. He was going to fix everything, mm -hmm. don't you know? And this is this is a real thing, and, and there are people who think that if we get the right guy in power, he's going to snap his fingers, he's going to sign a bill, he's going to say the word, and everything's going to change. No one calls it magic, but it sure sounds an awful lot like magic. Interestingly enough, not too long ago in California, our governor uh, made a statement and everybody immediately said, oh, no, more government limitations. He just said it. It's the law. And it took the voice of some Christian attorneys to say um, he just said it in passing in a, um, in a press conference. 
That doesn't make it a law. There's no executive order. <laughs> We've looked. Nothing's gone to the legislature. There's no e there's nothing here. He just said it. But we're now conditioned to the point where when someone with power says something, we simply assume, oh, well, that's I guess that's how it is now. And that's very dangerous, mm -hmm. whether in the political sphere or an ecclesiastical one. Mm -hmm. When a pastor, a preacher, a bishop, cult leader can say the word and everyone assumes, well, he said it, that's that's how it's going to be now. Uh, you can think back to uh, certain predictions about when the world was going to end. But no, he said it. It's going to happen. Well, what if it doesn't? Well, but he said it. It has to. Uh, false prophet much? Yep. <laughs> because that because that's the kind of thing that prophets do. They predict the future. In fact, the um, this this took me a while to figure out. Um, Balaam, when he is uh, he's pro he's hired to prophesy. You know, we, th we think of prophecy more as telling what's going to happen in the future. But for the pagan world, your prophecy created the future. Right. Balaam was not simply being hired to say what would happen by, by foreseeing it. He was called upon to shape the future by his magical words. And so that's why the, the king of Moab got very upset about him when he started blessing God's people. Because you're supposed to destroy them with your magic words. <laughs> Not recognize that God's, and, and Balaam says, uh, I've received a command to bless it. I can't reverse it. He can't undo God's sovereign decree. He can recognize it, or he can try to keep quiet about it. That didn't work too well either. But his words are no match for God's words. But we, we again, in, in America, and just coming full circle to where Brian started us, as, as we look at a number of loud voices in televangelism and in some of the, the big super churches, we are getting voices that say they command the future, they command the present, they command health, they command wealth. And if we if we're not on their side, then we are agents of Satan, voices of doubt, unbelievers, because they have that kind of power. And as afraid as we are of sometimes of the civil government misusing power, we need to watch the churches too, or those mm -hmm. that claim to be churches. Mm -hmm. That's a yeah. very great danger there. Mm -hmm. Yep, it comes back every every so often. You've got the the secret, the power of positive thinking. It's just yeah. the same thing repackaged over and over, and it's been that way since. You shall be as gods. Yeah, if I can yeah. say the words or think the thoughts, then it's going to alter reality. Visualize visualize world peace. Yeah. <laughs> the, the world is simply the construct of all human minds together. If we can just see it and think it and concentrate on it, it will happen. And Christians are the ones who are saying, yeah, no, it, it doesn't work that way. You're enemies of world peace. No, <laughs> but it doesn't come by magic. This isn't magic. This is, work. I don't know what, yeah, it's, I don't know what, the, what it is. It doesn't matter what they call it. And they're not very honest themselves. I mean, most magicians don't understand what magic is anyway but there is one thing that always goes with magic you're selling your soul to the devil whether there's an explicit pact is irrelevant you are surrendering to satan's initial lie and you are siding with hell against heaven and against god and rather than submitting to jesus name and using his name lawfully whether and, and this would be a good place as, as we wrap up to sum up jesus gave us his name so we could pray we pray in jesus name we are pastors blessed in Jesus' name. We perform church discipline, opening or closing the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. We worship in Jesus' name. And how uh, about baptism? We baptize in Jesus' name. We celebrate the supper in Jesus' name. These are things that carry enormous spiritual power, but none of them is magic. You can't go around sprinkling water on people and turning them into Christians. <laughs> I baptize you. Baptize yeah. you. Baptize you. <laughs> this is Not you can't to mention... Go Church discipline yeah. is also done yeah. in Jesus' name. Yeah. Whatsoever mm -hmm. you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Mm -hmm. And where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them, what most people overlook, is that the context there is that of church discipline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the um, the verb tenses are interesting. Whatsoever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the verb tenses assume that we are merely ratifying what Jesus has already done. He's already excommunicated this unbeliever, this apostate. We're simply working that out on earth, and therefore it holds. We're not, for, we're not 
mean. We're not twisting Jesus' arm and trying to get him to be mean to these people. Jesus has already said, look, in terms of my word, he's not a believer. You need to recognize that. Yeah. And that's why it carries authority, because we're simply doing what Jesus has already said. We don't have the magic to make people Christians or to unmake them. We have the legal authority to recognize their state in terms of the clear commands of Scripture, in terms of what the gospel actually says. So covenant versus magic, two different ways of approaching reality. All right. This has been our discussion of the third commandment on Halting Towards Zion. Uh, let's switch over and do some recos. You have any recos, Greg? I got one. Yay. This happens to be for my own daughter. <laughs> my uh, daughter, Haley, loves children, loves stories, loves children's stories. And she's begun an is in a series of Instagram posts that um, I don't know how this works, but this is what she handed me. It's Lynn Loves Stories, L-I-N dot loves dot stories. Uh, I assume because her name, her middle name is Kate Lynn, so she's probably borrowing that. And she, I asked her to sum it up for me, and it says, posts about books I like, mostly children's books, but the best children's books are for everyone. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. As Lewis said, if it's not a good enough story for an adult to uh, listen to, then it's not a good enough story for a child to listen to anyway. And I know the first thing that I bought for my oldest daughter before she was born we wandered into a department story, and there was Make Way for Ducklings, oh, yes. which I used to listen to <laughs> on Captain Kangaroo when I was about five. <laughs> and a lot of the books that we bought, for the, at least the ones I bought for my daughters, were things that I learned from Captain Kangaroo because he picked great books, great stories uh, that were worth the attention of an adult. But the artwork was, was similar. The artwork was impressive. It was beautiful. And it drew you in. So Haley in her Instagram thing is going to be talking about these and she would appreciate a visit from you if you like children's stories or just like stories in general. Cool, cool. Nice. Brian? Keeping in, I guess, in tune with my, my general pattern of recommending things from all across different types <laughs> of recommendation spectrums, I'm going to recommend puzzles. Oh, puzzles. yeah. Because yeah. Uh, what kind of puzzles? I was thinking jigsaw puzzles in this particular yes. case, uh, although any kind of puzzles will do. Uh, <laughs> I I recently, uh, probably at the end of last month, actually, purchased a very lovely uh, and expensive uh, puzzle that was of a wolf's head in this mm. kind of, I don't even know what you would call the art style. I have the box here so I can show you guys. It looks like this. Oh, oh neato. Oh, yeah. Um, it was expensive, though, and that's why I'm not going to necessarily recommend that one to anybody on a budget. But <laughs> I splurged for once. It's like the only puzzle I've bought in 10 years. I figured that was okay. <laughs> and it's just fun. You sit down for a few hours and you put together this thing, and it's challenging and fun and all of that. And It's, it's a good time. I recommend it. Have fun. <laughs> awesome. My uh, recommendation. You... Hmm? Go ahead. Go ahead. Just, let me... Let me steal your thunder here for just a second. Do you either of you remember the jigsaw puzzle that was in my classroom? I think it was there when you were there. Of yeah. Shakespeare. Yeah. All the different of figures of speech and things. Yeah. I do not it, remember this. You do not. I'll have to. Oh, let's see. There it is. It's by T.E. Breitenbach. It's, um, it just says Shakespeare. Um, there's more to it, but I can't. anyway, it's a visualization of a lot of the 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 quotes, allusions, and quips from Shakespeare. For instance, you have a woman looking at a costume of a of a uh, honeybee, as if she is contemplating to be oh. <laughs> or not to be. <laughs> to be. There is <laughs> there is a lamp being thrown out of a window, so that we exclaim. What light, what light from yonder window <laughs> shines. And below that, there's a chef ordering a Dalmatian out of his uh, eating establishment. And we are to think, out, out, <laughs> spot. <laughs> and there's another guy in a pickle suit. I am in such a pickle. Anyway, the whole puzzle is full of these things. I just thought of that. And thought I should. Mention, Amazing! So. I'm going to get that. 
the other one that okay. I saw an ad for was um, the Rose Window at oh oh, and it was like a thousand one. piece puzzle at Notre Dame. Yeah, I really kind of want that one too. That'd be great. <laughs> All right, Emily. My recommendation is a television show. It is a British sitcom from the 70s that David and I have been enjoying lately. (laughs) Speaking of having fun, you know, it is called Good Neighbors. Um, At least that was the name of it in England. When they brought it over to the United States, there was already a different show by that name. So they called it The Good Life, which I think is a very apt title for all its Aristotelian allusions. Um, (laughs) The story is... Uh, two two couples that live next to each other. The title couple is the Goods, uh, and ha, ha, I see what you, the, did you there. get. Yeah, you get the joke. But their their neighbors are the Ledbetters, <laughs> and Tom Good and Jerry Ledbetter look work at the same company, which is a great big company that makes the little plastic animals that go in cereal boxes. <laughs> and Jerry takes his job very seriously, <laughs> and Tom Good just cannot keep a straight face at any meetings and therefore Mm. does not get very high up the corporate ladder (laughs) and is just very dissatisfied with this corporate kind of hamster wheel. So on his 40th birthday, his wife, well, he has this idea and he convinces his wife to get on board that they are going to be self-sufficient. They're going to get rid of the rat race and just stay in their little home in suburbia and grow all their own food and have animals and stuff and try and get along without the corporate world. So it's very entertaining. I like it because there's a lot of just interpersonal hilarity between these two couples. Very good marriage dynamics for the most part. And David loves it because it's just so entertaining to see what Tom Good comes up with to generate his electricity (laughs) and like all these inventions to sort of get along with what they have. So... Do recommend that show. It's a great one. Again, Good Neighbors or The Good Life. All right. So thank you guys so much for being here and having this conversation. Thank you also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, Send us your feedback. We are reachable at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. You can like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Let us know what you think. See you next week.